And we are approaching 80 participants with us today for today's workshop. Uh, as we look at the agenda on the screen, um, let me say a few words about who we invited today. So on the call with us, we have members of our Transportation Policy Board, uh, which is the policymaking authority for the seven counties uh, around Nashville, Davidson County, when it comes to federal transportation grants and how those dollars are going to be spent on roads and bridges and walking and biking facilities uh, over the next 25 years. Um, so on that board are city and county mayors, transportation officials at the local, uh, regional and state level. We also have invited to today's meeting our transportation coordinating committee, which consists of uh, staff leadership from municipal governments, county governments, uh, state and federal agencies um, in roles that pertain to land use and zoning and uh, growth planning and infrastructure planning and uh, public works uh, project delivery. Uh, we've also invited uh, several other um, boards and committees that are part of the Greater Nashville Regional Council organization structure that have an interest in how Middle Tennessee grows. Uh, we've included the board of directors for the Mid-Cumberland Area Development Corporation, which is our small business lending arm. Uh, we've included the Aging Advisory Committee of the Greater Nashville Regional Council, which helps advise uh, our organization and our mayors on priorities for the investments we make in aging and disability services. We've invited members from three of our roundtables that we facilitate on a regular basis, including the environmental uh, roundtable, which is made up of nonprofits and agencies that are interested in uh, improving environmental outcomes and conserving and preserving um, the natural and sociocultural assets uh, for Middle Tennessee's future. Uh, we've invited the Solid Waste Directors Roundtable, which has worked with our staff on Middle Tennessee's first ever regional solid waste plan. And we've invited the Information Technology Directors Roundtable, uh, which is a group that we help facilitate discussion among, among as we uh, address issues of cybersecurity uh, and, and innovations and in technology that are coming our way for a variety of applications. So we have a pretty good diverse group uh, on the line with us. We're up to 85 folks. Uh, let's look at the agenda real quick before we uh, get into the material. Um, uh, I'll begin with a quick primer on forecasting, just to kind of get everybody warmed up and provide a state perspective and to talk about the importance of uh, forecasting future growth and development um, for planning purposes, both at the local and the regional level. And then I'm going to turn it over to Max Baker, who is our research and uh, analytics director to uh, provide to you a look at the results from um, this, uh, this new wave of growth and development forecast. Some of this information may look familiar to you, but I assure you that it's new. This is uh, the final iteration of this cycle of growth forecasting uh, that we're going to be sharing with you today. Uh, there are definitely differences uh, in the trends that we're seeing, even though they may be nuanced uh, from those that we presented about five years ago. He will then introduce Sean Falzer, our transportation planning manager and coordinator for the Nashville Area MPO program, to talk about the predicted impacts that that growth will have on the transportation system. Then he and I will wrap up with a look at how you can take advantage of a few opportunities to shape our response uh, to that traffic congestion. And then if there's interest, we'll hang it around for questions for as long as you would like. Speaking of questions, uh, we will take questions in the chat and we have staff on standby to answer those along the way. But by and large, we'll be holding those until we get uh, through the information. There's a lot of information that we've got for you today and uh, we'd like to get through that before we get into Q&A. That said, um, recognizing that this isn't always the best forum to get into discussion, uh, we have it's one of those opportunities um, scheduled a series of small group discussions and conversations about the information that you're going to be seeing today. So that, that will be an opportunity for you uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, again, today's presenters are going to be largely Sean Falzer and Max Baker, um, but they are representing a much broader team of experts um, uh, within the planning and research team. And uh, I pulled together this slide fairly quickly, and I can already tell that, uh, Ben, please forgive me. I don't see your photo on here, but Ben Grambling is our environmental planning manager, 
and as important as anybody else uh, on the slide. I, I think my point here was, you know, especially in the day of, uh, of webinars, um, you know, faces aren't often seen anymore. And I think it's important for you all to realize that we've got uh, great experts working at the Greater National Regional Council on your behalf. And there's a lot of teamwork that goes into the, the material that Sean and Max are going to be presenting to you. So again, apologies, Ben. Uh, please forgive me for, for that oversight on my part. So speaking of um, uh, the team teamwork, um, we do have some active participation uh, in today's uh, throughout today's presentation, uh, and our folks and part the partners our partners in Gallatin will be familiar with uh, the polling that we've integrated today. Was, we used it uh, through a workshop that we hosted with them and their community not long ago. But uh, to participate in today's uh, ongoing poll questions, uh, I'd ask you to now grab your cell phone and text MSkipper999. And I, I promise you that's <laughs> that's not for self-promotion, that's just the username that we have for the account, MSkipper999 to the phone number 22333. And that'll get you set up uh, and able to respond to the poll questions, which uh, will all be by text. Um, once you text to that number, uh, MSkipper999, uh, you should get a confirmation uh, text back letting you know that you're all set to go. Just to make sure you are, let's go ahead and test this out. So the first question that we have for you today, it's a pretty easy one, which would be what one word would you use to describe yourself? All right, outgoing. It's no surprise that would be the, the largest word on the screen. Huh? Well, what I'd like to do is because I know we might have folks join as we go through this. If I could get uh, a member of our staff to put into the text or the chat box the instructions for the text to poll. Again, it's to text mskipper999 to the phone number 22333. If I can get somebody to do that, that would be helpful. And if I could also get somebody to periodically remind folks to sign in at gnrc.org slash sign in. And uh, with our web address, you do need to enter the www uh, before that. So anyway, really appreciate the responses uh, to, the, to this question. Let's try one more question because we've got to um, test out this, uh, this other form of question that we got. Uh, so the question is, which city has had the highest growth rate in the ten in Tennessee, in the entire state between 2010 and 2019. And you can, we've got this set, you can vote as many times as you like. So if you want to change your mind, I go ahead and do that. Well, the answer is Spring Hill which has grown by a little over 50% in population uh, since 2010. Um, and this list is actually in order of the top four fastest growing cities in the entire state uh, between 2010 and 2019. So we've got Spring Hill at number one, Mount Juliet, number two, Gallatin at number three, and Lebanon at number four. Of course, this is percentage growth. Um, uh, we're also interested in absolute growth, which we will get into as we go through the presentation today. So again, thanks for registering for the text for poll and participating in those two questions. Let's go ahead and get into uh, the material. So just, just to set the stage a little bit for some of the data that you're going to see about our region, I wanted to provide a, a statewide context uh, for that. So here we have uh, a map of the count, 95 counties across Tennessee, and here in dark, um, outline, you see the 14 counties that are associated with the GNRC planning area. What I'm going to show you next is population by county in 2017. Uh, the darker the color, obviously, the more populated that county is. We've got two counties as of 2017 that have half a million or more in population. Not surprisingly, that would be Davidson and Shelby County. And Rutherford County would be 
adjoining Knox County and Hamilton County in that 250 to 500,000 population range uh, in 2017. Uh, what's significant uh, about this slide as well is that the look at the 6.6 .6 million people across the state, about 30% of that population resides within that 14 county footprint that GNRC represents. So almost a third of the state in 2017 uh, lives within that region. Looking ahead to 2045, and these are the forecasts done by Woods and Pool Economics, which is uh, the source of the, for the population and employment projections used by the Greater Nashville Regional Council and its exercises. Uh, looking ahead to 2045, uh, same uh, categorization there, uh, it's, but some differences. You've got uh, three additional counties joining that 500,000 or more club. That would be Williamson County, Rutherford County, and Knox County. Uh, Memphis actually begins to, or Shelby County, it will exceed a million in population by the year 2045. Uh, um, also significant on the slide is that our share of the state's population has now increased to 37 uh, percent. And this is the, this is the telling the story here. So this is the net change between 2017 and 2045, according to these projections nearly 60% of the state's growth that's expected through 2045 is anticipated to occur within the Middle Tennessee area. Uh, also significant on, uh, on this slide, and I'll just go to the next one to illustrate this better, uh, is the uh, amount of growth happening in Middle Tennessee relative to the rest of the state. Again, 60% of the growth happening here within Middle Tennessee, leading to uh, this top 10 list, which is uh, rather astonishing when we think about the big four uh, across Tennessee, uh, Nashville, Memphis, Knoxville, Chattanooga. Um, we kind of shake up that, um, that notion a little bit with this new top 10 list where you have Rutherford and Williamson counties both leapfrogging Hamilton County in terms of uh, population by 2045. Um, six of the uh, top 10 counties for population by then are located uh, right around uh, Nashville, Davidson County. Um, and then in parentheses there, you see the fastest growing counties in terms of absolute growth. And so Williamson County and Rutherford County are expected to add the most amount of people between now and 2045. So again, this is to set the stage for our discussion today about growth within Middle Tennessee. Um, our, our projections are nested within that framework that I just talked about. And over the last few months, we have been sharing with our membership county level projections uh, and, and, and the sort of the, the numbers behind the numbers in terms of demographic shifts, uh, shifts in socioeconomics. Uh, shifts in employment classifications and job sectors. And so there's a lot of nuance behind these forecasts that help us understand not only how many people and jobs we'll have in Middle Tennessee, but their makeup, um, which is really important to understand as we try to predict the impacts that growth will have uh, across the landscape and including uh, on transportation infrastructure. So uh, again, just a high level look at the county level projections for population employment. Uh, we're about to make you uh, make available this to you for further study, so there's no reason to dwell on that now. The other thing that we do, uh, and this is value added by GNRC, whereas our county level projections come from Woods and Pool, which is sourced from a national control total, which is thinking about shifts in uh, metro economies uh, and the overall growth of the nation. What we bring to the table is a relatively sophisticated land use allocation model that can predict where that county growth is gonna go with within, so at the municipal level and with that at the census designated place level. Uh, this is a handout that will also make available to, to you all, but it's the 2045 projection of, of households and employment uh, for municipalities across the 14 counties that the Greater Nashville uh, Council represents. Um, if you want to get uh, your hands on some of this data now, in, at least in terms of uh, interactive dashboards, uh, go over to www.gnrc.org slash dashboards and you could explore uh, these trends from, from home. Uh, and it's not just population, demographics, and employment uh, dashboards we have up here. We have all, all kinds of dashboards that track transportation-related performance measures. We've even got a COVID-19 uh, dashboard that is tracking cases and, and, and mobility across Middle Tennessee. So let me plug that resource um, before we get any, any further. Real quickly, um, let us state um, from our perspective the importance of doing this work. Um, today, we're gonna be talking a lot about the impact that growth and development will have on our transportation system. 
but I want you to be aware uh, of its value to other, other exercises that are underway. One of the most significant ones uh, relates to the work that we're doing with our environmental roundtable, which is aimed largely at trying to understand where growth is headed, sort of uh, we want to skate to the puck, if you will, with respect to uh, making sure that we can minimize the conflicts between that growth and development and the environmental resources that are out there. And so uh, through Ben Gramling's leadership on staff, uh, he's been working with a roundtable to marry up the growth and development forecasts. And these are sort of um, these are older maps that will be updated with the material that we're presenting today, but to sort of get ahead of the, the game in terms of talking about how we can mitigate the impacts that growth and development might have on natural resources or cultural, uh, sociocultural assets that are important to Middle Tennesseans. Uh, the Middle Tennessee Solid Waste Plan is another uh, area of opportunity to fuse together the forecast we're talking about today with resource allocation and planning for infrastructure. Uh, and then at the local level, uh, we use these tools to develop our comprehensive plans. Uh, in the case of Plan Gallatin, uh, we have the uh, honor of working directly with the city of Gallatin on updating their comprehensive plan. Uh, but these models are really good for fast forwarding, fast forwarding future outcomes uh, um, to today, so we could see the, the, if you will, the consequences of some of the policy decisions uh, that we're making, uh, so that we can alter our course for better outcomes into the future. So, a lot of relevancy uh, for the the material that we have for you. And though we are committed to using it at the regional scale, we do very much encourage you to use this data that will make available to you freely uh, in your local planning. Uh, process as well. Uh, one more thing before I turn it over to Max. Um, a lot of the data that we have for you today is going to be shown through a seven county lens. It's Nashville, Davidson County, and the immediate surrounding counties that represent the Nashville Area MPO program. But we have all this data except for the transportation stuff for all 14 counties of the Greater Nashville Regional Council. So if you're on the call from Humphreys or Houston or Stewart County or Montgomery County, know that we, the population employment and land development forecasts uh, exist for you as well. And we'll make sure you have access uh, to that. But since the focus of today's uh, conversation is really on the impact of growth and development on, on the transportation system, a lot of that modeling data comes specifically from, uh, from the NPO resource uh, for those seven counties. So with that, uh, again, thank you for joining us today. We're up to 94 folks. Um, sign in at www.gnrc.org slash sign in. And as you're doing that, um, I'm going to introduce Max Baker, who is our Director of Research and Analytics, to walk you through hot off the press predictions for future growth and development. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I guess the, the first step is how do we how do we do this? How are we forecasting into the future uh, population and employment? Uh, taking a look at the countywide um, numbers that Michael uh, presented on earlier, uh, we developed a new predictive growth model uh, using the urban sim platform. This is used in several large um, municipal area or uh, metro areas around the, the nation and really the world. Uh, it relies on zoning and local land use policy, land use values or land values, uh, infrastructure availability, market behaviors uh, to predict where people will live and work within our region. And we've been creating this over the course of uh, a little over a year in cooperation with uh, a lot of the local governments uh, in, in the planning arena. So this is a, a product of, of not just GNRC staff, but also, also the staff of local jurisdictions. Next slide, please. Uh, before we get started, uh, like Michael said, we, we've got a lot of this material available online. Uh, we're currently uploading uh, the forecast to a ARC Online application. I uh, believe we have households and employment already up there and are currently working on population and, and the combination population and jobs. Um, feel free to, to visit this site as well as our dashboards. As well, we will continue to, to get that stuff um, available to you as much as we can. So uh, jumping into it, um, you know, where are we starting from? Where, where, what does 2017, which is our, our base here, look like? Um, I'm showing initially the, the parcel information. Uh, this is 
to let you know that it exists, although we typically don't um, present it in this way uh, because of the the detail within it. it. It makes much more sense when you when you aggregate it up to larger levels, either small area jurisdictions or or in our case, we use uh, census blocks since people are, are very familiar with that. Um, this is used for the baseline of the behavior in the land use model. So a lot of the choices that are made going into future years are based off of what is existing on the ground today. So um, household size, the, the particular demographics that are that are on the ground in 2017 and, and how those might um, go into the future. Um, First, we're going to take a look at the several different ways that you can look at 2017. So it's not just households. Uh, you're looking at households, the people that are within the households, the employment that is on the ground, as well as the development pattern, and ultimately what the urban footprint um, results from that. Um, as we go cycle through the slides, I want to mention the box that you see on the left-hand side. Uh, the top number is the the actual value, so in this case, the 623,540 households that you see on the map there, and a distribution of whether it is in the current incorporated area boundary, the remainder of the urban growth boundary. So these are the adopted urban growth boundaries uh, where targeted growth is expected and encouraged, and then uh, that beyond the UGB, which is outside of those urban growth boundaries in the remainder of the county. Pay attention to these numbers as we cycle through the years and the distribution. It, it uh, seems that th they will um, go up in areas that you would not expect them to. So uh, as we transition from the households to population, um, you know, Obviously, these are very similar uh, where you'll see slight differences are in the suburban and, and rural areas where you see more single family homes that typically have more population per household. And next slide. And the job distribution, which is probably not surprising, typically located along the interstate and, and major roadway corridors uh, where the land use is supporting non residential uses. Next slide. And then when you combine both population and employment, it gives you a sense of a, a development pattern, but at the density level. So, um, you know, looking at this, I don't think it's anything that's too terribly surprising. Um, as we transition into the next set of maps, um, it's where your eyebrows will start to, to rise a little bit. So take that last map. Um, and this is the same information, but it is looking at parcels that have significant development on it and the current distribution of where those are within the uh, city limits, the UGB and, and beyond. And so as we cycle through uh, our horizon years of 2020, 2025, 35, and 45, um, it looks very scary. It looks like almost everything is, is developing. And, and I grant you this is not the case. There is a density component to it. But when you when you do look at this, it, it is uh, jaw dropping, to say the least. I think, you know, Williamson, Rutherford and to an extent, Wilson counties are are seeing significant growth, um, both in their urban and rural areas. And probably the, the one takeaway would be the net, right? So uh, looking at what is um, expected to be on the ground between 2017 and, and the forecasted year, there's a lot of uh, the parcels that are being developed that are outside of the, the UGB or outside of where we would typically want them to go. Um, so just keep that, keep that in mind as, as we uh, go through the rest of these slides. So like I mentioned, there is the, the density component to it. Um, it's not as scary as it looks. A lot of those areas that, that showed up as um, a developed parcel are within that, that low density or less than 100 persons per square mile. So this is looking at population aggregated up to the block level. So it's a little bit easier to understand or, or to see uh, the changes as we cycle through here. 20, 25, 35, and 45, you really see how 
the increase is occurring outside of the UGB, particularly in between the I-65 and I-24 in Rutherford and Williamson County. Um, it's almost as if they're <laughs> growing together. There's also significant um, significant growth south of Mount Juliet in Wilson County and in Fairview and in the area between Portland and Gallatin. Uh, you'll see, see some growth there. So looking at the net, uh, this is showing the top quartile. Um, so the 25% um, fastest growing blocks in the region. Uh, no surprise that in that Williamson and Rutherford County area, uh, as well as other uh, urban areas. All right, next slide. Similar progression, looking at jobs. Um, this one's, I guess, less of the sprawl that you would see with, with the population, and that's likely due to the, the zoning or the, the underlying policy. Um, most non-residential is aligned within those commercial corridors, and that, that does hold true going into the future. Although you do see some slight um, increases in areas outside of that uh, within your hamlets and, and small nodes out at the, the rural kind of crossroads. And next slide. So how does that translate to something that, that most people are familiar with, which is uh, urbanized our urban areas? Uh, those consist of the urbanized areas over uh, 50,000 population and the urban clusters. Um, this one was very impressive to me and, and had quite a, a good takeaway. So as we cycle through, you can see what it was in 2010, what a potential 2020 uh, after the census comes out uh, might look like, and ultimately what a 2045 could look like. Um, you know, we're essentially doubling the population uh, in, in the seven county area during this time. We're also doubling the um, square miles of the potential urbanized area, but you know, one thing that, that's slightly impressive is that we're increasing the percentage of population that is within those areas. So, so it's almost like we're growing um, not aligned to the boundaries, so not, not, with, not aligned to city limits or the urban growth boundaries. You know, we, we saw where that was occurring outside of where we would expect it to, but it is happening in a contiguous area. Um, the importance of this is, is that our uh, typically isolated or, or historically isolated uh, clusters are now somewhat merging into uh, one area, which, which really calls for the need for multi-jurisdictional cooperation as our, our, our lines are beginning to blur when, when it's going from one community to the next. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sean to discuss how, how the impact of the significant growth um, you know, might potentially um, impact the, the transportation system. Uh, Sean, are you there? Thank you, Max. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Sean Palzer, Transportation Planning Manager with GNRC. I'm going to walk through this next section, which focuses on the predicted impact of the transportation system, given the future growth and development that Max has discussed. Um, similar to the land use model, we also have a sophisticated tool to predict future travel demand uh, based on transportation choices that individuals are making across the region on a daily basis. Um, so this model utilizes the TransCAD software and relies upon various inputs um, and generates a number of system performance outputs that we're going to cover today. So before we dive into the future demand on the transportation network, um, just a quick look at what the existing capacity or roadway capacity is of the system. Um, this is capturing how much traffic that the, the system can accommodate. And so we measure capacity in roadway lane miles. And in the region, there's approximately 28,000 uh, lane miles. And this map indicates kind of the density of that capacity and where. Uh, more capacity is concentrated typically in and around downtown and along the interstate corridors. Um, given the interstate's roadway capacity, um, theoretically we could accommodate 745 million vehicle miles of travel daily. Um, that doesn't actually happen in reality. Um, we use a, a small fraction of, the, of that overall capacity. Um, daily demand is typically measured in vehicle miles traveled. 
um, or known as, as VMT. And um, that's approximately uh, 56 million vehicle miles traveled uh, throughout the region on a daily basis. Um, and that that equates to, um, I don't, I don't want to uh, get the, reveal the punchline here, but um, I think this is an opportunity to get into what the um, average daily vehicle travel is per capita across the seven county area. And this would be in, in the current baseline conditions. Well, Sean, it looks like they are underestimating it a bit at 27 miles traveled per capita. You want to give them the correct answer? It looks like they came on strong at the end there, though. Yeah, it looks like um, about 41% of people got the answer correct, which is a VMT capita of um, 37 miles, 36.6 miles per day, um, which is pre pretty high, um, especially in comparison to some of the peers. Um, when And that daily demand is largely concentrated on the interstates and, and principal arterials in and out of downtown Nashville. Um, in addition, that daily demand is also concentrated into specific time periods of the day. Um, as you all know, typically during the morning and evening commute hours. Um, we've looked at that data and um, I think the morning and evening commutes, um, which only capture about six hours of the day, uh, account for half of the daily VMT, uh, I think, which is surprising. And then as the region is set to grow to you know, more than 2.3 million people by 2045, um, so is demand on the transportation system. Uh, as we look at this map, by 2045, daily VMT is forecasted to increase from 59 million to 78 million. Um, there is a, um, and that's despite a reduction in daily VMT per capita from that 36.6 that we mentioned uh, down to 29.5. Um, miles. And so kind of between, you know, now and 2045, we're looking at that daily VMT. Um, it's increasing by roughly a third and that VMT, uh, VMT per capita is dropping by 20%. Um, and the growth is continuing to occur along the, the interstate corridors, uh, but we're also seeing high VMT growth in areas along uh, Interstate 840. Um, and in and around a lot of the downtown centers um, like Franklin and, and Murfreesboro and Smyrna. So kind of as we get in now, we've talked a little bit about demand, but what is the impact of that demand on the system? And so um, we're going to go talk through a little bit about uh, traffic congestion and, and some of the uh, background information on that. Um, you know, traffic is a traffic congestion is a popular topic uh, across the, the, the world. Um, you know, nationally, there's a number of peer reports that come out, um, often comparing metro areas across the nation. This map from um, FHWA's urban congestion reports characterizes some of the recent traffic congestion trends and reliability trends across the nation. Um, you'll notice that Nashville has a big red dot, and that's not a good sign. That uh, actually indicates that of the three measures that they're using to examine congestion changes over time, that um, we were declining in all three of those measures uh, since the previous year. And then within um, our state, also um, comparing kind of the metros within the state, um, this is looking particularly at reliability, so kind of the variability in congestion and um, notes that the Nashville area has decreased um, in terms of reliability, both on the interstate system, as you see in this slide, um, over the past few years. So between 2016 and 2019, um, the travel time reliability de decreased by 3% on the interstate side. And then on the next slide um, shows the non-interstate system, which decreased by 4% over that same time period. And I'll make a note too here that um, reliability is one of the aspects of congestion or dimensions of congestion that we're um, doing more analysis on now. Um, you know, it, it gets at, I think it's increasingly important because um, you know, people are 
more likely to tolerate congestion when it is more consistent. Um, but I, I think everyone can become extremely frustrated when it takes, you know, two to three times as long um, to get to uh, a common destination. So we'll elaborate a little bit more on the reliability as we go. So why this topic matters, um, there's a number of, uh, of items. Um, one would just be personal convenience. Um, you know, congestion causes you to be late for work, uh, appointments, or picking up kids from daycare. Um, also, costs associated with uh, congestion um, added on to, you know, your drivers or, or commuters along the roadway. Um, then also, it increases the cost of doing business. So, uh, through you know delayed shipments or disruptions in the supply chain as a result of congestion um, can impact businesses and the economy. It could also pose um, threat to quality of life. Um, you know, time spent in congestion can take away opportunities to spend time with family, friends, um, or even opportunities for physical activity. Michael, are you still there? Might need to pull up slides on my end. Um, some of the other um, some of the other impacts would be um, environmental impacts. So congestion also you know worsens air quality in the region and can result in negative health outcomes for residents of the region. Um, and then it's also, um, you know, why this topic matters is a federal requirement. Um, we prepare a uh, or update our congestion management process, um, which we're in the process of doing right now. And the congestion management process, also known as the CMP, um, is a eight step process to ensure that America's urban areas are effectively managing traffic congestion um, with the resources provided by the federal government. And so as I mentioned, it's an eight-step eight process, and we'll, um, you know, uh, uh, I think today we're um, talking through a lot of the, um, analyzing some of the problems and, and needs, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more at the end about um, some of the progress that we've made on the other steps. So there's two main um, uh, causes of congestion or, or um, causes of congestion that we break it down into. Um, you know, congestion can vary by location or time of day. Um, but we tend to, tend to break those into non-recurring as well as recurring congestion. Um, on the non-recurring congestion, um, this typically involves factors like crashes, uh, weather conditions, construction and work zones, or special events. Um, these these things can you know impact and disrupt the regular flow of traffic. Um, crashes can block lanes or cause rubbernecking. Um, adverse weather conditions can, you know, decrease speeds or increase the following distances for vehicles um, in order in order to um, cause delays. And then, you know, work zones I, th I think are um, increasingly common in the Nashville region, and they can also serve as a source of delay as um, you know they temporarily temporarily reduce the roadway capacity or um, close lanes throughout the system. And then, lastly, the special events. Um, you know, Middle Tennessee is well known for for hosting a number of large events, uh, sporting events, festivals, concerts, and um, with the large crowds, there there can be conge congestion challenges as well, given that the um, causes sudden changes in, in travel demand. So I think we have another polling question for folks um, as we talk about some of these non-recurring causes of congestion. Um, we talked about one being crashes. So how many crashes per day did the seven county area average between 2015 and 2019? Give folks a few moments to provide their answers. All right, Sean, looks like a little little underestimation happening here again. Uh, you want to give them the answer? Yeah, so in the region, there are nearly 200 crashes per day um, over that time period, the last five years. Um, and approximately 40% of those crashes occurred during the, the AM and, and evening commute. And so um, 
that's problematic given that, you know, that's also when the system is uh, the most taxed. So this map shows the, um, the crashes that occurred throughout the region, and then this one shows the concentration of those, of those crashes, um, how they, in, in total over that five-year horizon, um, the, the crashes that occurred um, th throughout the region. And I think also uh, the next map shows too that crashes don't have to be severe in order to you know disrupt the um, transportation system. A approximately one third of crashes are, are rear end crashes, and um, they still have a uh, major disruption to the system and, and impact congestion. So the other type of uh, congestion that we mentioned is is reoccurring congestion. Um, this uh, typically result, results when travel demand um, approaches or exceeds the available capacity of a facility. Um, it can be, you know, physical limitations of the roadway or, or the operation of the facility. Um, we talk about peak travel uh, being one of those those causes where uh, the typical time frames when volumes exceed uh, ca capacity of the system, um, typically during the work commutes in the morning and evening. Um, also often compounded by the school drop, uh, pick up and drop off from school, <clears throat> which, tends, which tends to overlap the, the work commute. And then um, also sometimes in, in retail or, or major shopping destinations where um, on, on weekends or, or holiday, the demand can re remain high. Um, also with merging traffic, um, these are you know locations where there can be bottlenecks within the system, um, either where lane drops occur or there's uh, interchanges present where vehicles are forced to submerge, and um, in order to do that, drivers typically decrease speeds to um, traverse those those road segments safely. And then also on traffic management, um, you know, traffic signals are, are um, you know serve serve a purpose and you know, an outdated or or not properly maintained. Uh, traffic control device can also disrupt uh, the flow of traffic um, and cause delays or, or um, unreliable travel times. And so, as we mentioned, you know, um, some of the common bottleneck locations include interchanges. Um, in the seven county area, there's approximately 1,250 interchanges um, across the interstate system. And then also, <clears throat> there's a, a number of traffic control devices. Um, there are more than 37,000 um, intersections across the region, and this shows the, the density of those uh, intersections. Um, and then of those, the approximately 13,000 of those traffic um, traffics or traffic signals um, across the region, you know, roughly a third, um, predominantly owned by and maintained by the local jurisdictions across the region. And then lastly, the, um, the schools. Um, we also wanted to mention schools and school zones, um, which can also experience congested conditions during those um, pick up and drop off uh, times in the, in the morning and afternoon. So with that, um, we'll jump into some of the uh, trends and forecasts now. I think we'll just um, we'll pull the PowerPoint back up. It's a pretty large file, so we're maybe having a, a few challenges with it. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about the, the trends and forecasts um, out to, out to uh, 2045. Um, so this is uh, a lot of the data that we're going to dive into is outputs of the travel demand model that we mentioned um, that will forecast the impact of growth and development and on performance of the system. Um, in a couple of different ways that we'll do that, we'll showcase kind of demand and, and what that, um, how that equates to um, or translates into speeds and um, congestion on the network. So just a refresher, um, when we talk about daily demand, uh, there's approximately 59 million um, vehicle miles traveled throughout the region on a daily basis, um, approximately 37 miles per capita. 
And then one way that we measure the, um, the intensity of that congestion is through travel speeds. Um, the way that we calculate travel speeds, um, or one way that we capture congestion through travel speeds is we calculate um, the percentage of free flow speed, um, basically by dividing the average roadway travel times or speeds um, during the peak hour and dividing that, which is the most congested time, and dividing that by the free flow speed during the non-peak hour. So um, when you, you can drive uninterrupted at um, ideal uh, speeds. Um, and so what we have for that is um, the existing baseline, and we'll come back to this and kind of take you through how that changes over time. And then based on those free flow speeds, we define those segments of the roadway or, or links in the model at um, less than 70% of free flow speed. And we find those as congestion, congested. And so, for example, uh, if we take a segment with a free flow speed of 70 miles an hour, um, it is defined as congested if its average travel speeds during the peak hour drop below 50 miles an hour. Um, and so this map identifies where that congestion occurs um, on the on the um, the network identified in that the light red lines. Uh, one other way that we measure congestion is um, we talked about the volume to capacity ratio, um, where you know if that uh, if the volumes start to exceed or, or greater than one um, volume start to exceed the capacity of the roadway system or its design capacity, um, we identify that as uh, level of service F uh, or volume exceeds capacity. And so um, from this currently the miles of the network that are congested approaches, you know, nearly uh, 2000 and that's given our you know current system and that's approximately one third of the roadway miles on the network. So as we look out in, into 2045, and the travel demand that we will face in 2045, um, just a re refresher that that increases from 59 million to 78 million. Um, it also has an impact on travel speeds. And so between now and 2045, the average travel speeds in the region are expected to decrease from 42 miles per hour to 36 miles per hour. Um, and that ranges based on the interstates versus the, the historic pikes. Um, you know, dropping seven miles an hour for the interstates, dropping five miles an hour for the pikes. Um, and then by uh, 2045, that the, the miles of the network that are congested increases to 2,800 miles, uh, reaching nearly half of the region's uh, roadway network on a typical weekday. And so now we'll take you through kind of that progression, um, just walking through travel speeds between now and 2045. So that's your 2020 and 2045. And you can see that the um, extent of the network um, that is ex experiencing that lower uh, free flow speeds or, or defined as congested congested is starting to extend throughout more of the network. And then if we go to um, congested links and we do the same, we'll progress from the baseline to Michael, are you able to advance? Just wait momentarily for that to come back. Um, I think the the story um, with congested links is going to be similar to speeds. Um, that net change as we go from the baseline in 2017 to the time horizons of 2025, 2035, 2045. Um, 
the number of congested links continues to expand throughout the system. Um, and by 2045, nearly a thousand additional miles of congest congestion uh, are on the region's roadway network. Which is approximately an increase of 15% of, of, the, of the network. And so um, next one I'll show is uh, the volume to capacity, which I mentioned is that uh, where the volume to capacity is, is one or greater, identifying some of those roadways that are exceeding their design capacity. Um, and this helps us identify where some of the, uh, the bottleneck locations are in the region. Um, you'll see that in 2017, um, the extent of the network that meets the V2C um, definition for, for congestion is about a third of, of the network, and then that increases um, to about half of the network by 2045. And then when we show the net change, um, which is really some of the, uh, the hot spots in terms of areas where um, volumes are going to exceed capacity in, in, in the future, um, we see a, a lot of uh, hot spots in and around uh, downtown centers like uh, Franklin and Murfreesboro, and Lebanon, Gallatin. And then also looking at another way that we look at this is um, as a result of the additional travel and congested conditions, time spent traveling also increases, um, which is me measured by daily vehicle hours. Um, so where this map identifies where people are spending the most time um, forecasted to, and as you can see from the map, um, uh, travelers are, are forecasted to spend more time along uh, interstate corridors like I-65 South, I-24 East, um, I-65 North, and then also um, on I-40 um, East as well as uh, within downtown centers like Franklin and Murfreesboro. And as we go out to 2045, that, that daily time spent traveling is forecasted to increase um, to, to roughly 3 million uh, vehicle hours of travel daily. So quick check to make sure everyone's still there. I know we uh, covered a lot of slides so far. Feel free to be honest here. So we've covered a lot of uh, material on all vehicles, and we want to switch gears briefly to just um, focus on, on trucks for a couple of slides. Um, vehicle miles traveled for trucks, so the, the truck demand uh, is currently about 5.2 million um, miles daily. Um, and approximately 41% of that truck vehicle miles traveled is, is within congestion on a daily basis. Um, as we get out to 2045, uh, daily truck VMT is expected to increase to uh, 6.3 million miles a day. And so that roughly, uh, you know, a million more miles of, uh, of truck travel on a daily basis. Um, and as a result, um, that percentage of, of truck VMT in congestion will increase from 41% to, to 56%. Um, and a lot of those additional truck miles uh, will continue to occur along, you know, I-24 South and I-65 North, uh, but there's also going to be a lot of growth along I-65 um, South, I-40 East and, and I-40 West. Um, and so this um, kind of going back to the amount of time spent. So this map identifies where the trucks will be spending uh, the most time throughout the region. Um, it's spending more time on I-65 South, I-24 East, um, I-65 North, and I-40 West, East, sorry. So um, we're going to focus, kind of zoom in from the regional level just down to take a closer look at downtown Nashville. And so the Folks are familiar with the, the interstate loop. Um, this is where I-24, I-40, I-65 converge and um, well-known largest bottleneck within the region. Um, it's, you know, this area is defined by a lot of dangerous weaving movements as, as motorists kind of navigate the different interchanges. 
um, and it results in a number of crashes and, and severe congestion within the region. And so um, just kind of recycling some of those slides that we showed you on, on travel speeds and how that changes over time, we'll just cycle through uh, to show you how the percent of free flow changes between now and 2045. And similarly, uh, with congested links, um, so links that we identified as congested, congested through between now and 2045. And so we spent a lot of time at the, the region-wide level, um, but we also want to give a preview of some of the corridor level analysis that we're doing. And so, um, most of this corridor level analysis will focus on the interstates as well as the um, you know, principal arterials or the pikes. And the way that we kind of split up these corridors is um, looking at kind of the uh, inner ring geography of um, you know, the interstate system within the in and around downtown, uh, the middle ring, which um, tends to go out to uh, 840 or approximately there, and then kind of that outer ring um, that captures the, the remaining fringe of the region. And so um, obviously the con congestion varies by location uh, within the region, but um, you can see from some of the um, uh, real-time data that we've pulled on uh, the existing system that duration um, you know, varies by the different um, uh, districts or rings that we've, we've analyzed the information in. So you know, duration kind of measured in the amount of time that that area is experiencing congestion varies. Um, in the outer area, it doesn't really meet the congestion threshold that we've established based on travel speeds um, and hasn't changed much between 2016 and 2019. As we move into the inner and middle rings, you start to see that uh, we're, we're approaching that congestion threshold and um, starting to, to notice some you know, increasing uh, duration between 2016 and 2019. And then as we get into the inner loop, um, this is where you, you see um, you know, congestion over multiple hours of the day um, and, and even a, um, an increasing amount of, or duration of congestion between uh, 2016 and 2019. And then you can see them all, all together just for comparison purposes. So to look at the interstate uh, corridors, we put together a couple of profiles uh, trying to you know, better compare the interstates against one another. Um, we, we used a number of data sources for this, um, primarily relying on the um, NPM RDS data set, the National Performance Measure Research data set, um, as well as the travel demand model for to populate some of these metrics. And so uh, one metric that we looked at was average speed, uh, as we've mentioned, and um, that was basically the average observed speed um, during the morning and in, in, in typical morning and, and um, evening commutes during the weekday. Um, and that, that captures the, the intensity of ingestion along these corridors. We also looked at delay um, in terms of minutes, so the number of minutes spent in traffic beyond what would occur during free flow um, for those same time periods, uh, weekday, morning and evening commute. And then we also looked at buffer time, um, which is a captures the reliability measure to better understand you know, how many additional minutes um, do you need above the free flow speeds in order to reach your destination um, it, reliably. And so, um, as you can see, we we noted some of the um, corridors where speeds were lower, uh, delay was higher, and um, the corridor was more um, unreliable in terms of having a, a higher uh, buffer time measure. And then if we go to the next one, so this rep represents um, baseline conditions. We also looked, utilized the model um, to look into percent of VMT in congestion, so the percent of those vehicle miles traveled that are on congested road segments, um, utilizing the model, which captures the, the extent of congestion within that corridor. And we did um, similar measure, but looking at the percent of vehicle hours of travel by trucks on congested road segments within the corridor. Um, 
and you'll, you'll see we highlighted some of those that um, where the extent of congestion is is, is higher than, than other corridors. And then um, we also wanted to know, you know, how are how are these metrics changing between 2017 and, and 2045? And so you'll notice that uh, the change uh, generally involves decreases in speeds, um, increases in the percent of, of VMT and congestion, and increases in the percent of truck VHT uh, in congestion as well. And um, you'll probably notice the I-40 I-24 West section, which um, was starting from a very low number, and so you see a, a very large uh, increase there. Uh, we also applied this same um, analysis to the, the, the pikes or the uh, principal arterials. Um, this one, we took a slightly different approach. We used some of the same measures, uh, but we recognized that um, these corridors are uh, a lot more complex than the interstates and in that um, there's there's more going on. So we tried to incorporate details like the um, number of intersections per mile, the crashes per mile, um, transit stops per mile, as well as the uh, bicycle facilities, uh, bicycle and pedestrian facilities within the corridor. And so um, you'll note that some of the uh, areas where, you know, crashes are higher, um, where there might be more intersections per mile um, or where, you know, pedestrian coverage might be um, lacking. And so um, we also looked at uh, the change between uh, 2017 and 2045 for the principal arterials. And um, similar trend um, in that there was decreases in speeds, um, increases in the percent of VMT in, congest in congested conditions. Um, and also increases in the percent of truck VHT and congestion. Um, and some of some of the most dramatic um, changes, percent changes were were in that outer ring um, corridor segment. I think this might be the last map that we have to show you. And this one we just wanted to um, kind of note the importance. Um, this highlights some of the most congested corridors, um, kind of those that rank in the top 5% based on congestion, but also the importance of, of safety when it comes to congestion. And, um, you know, with that nearly 200 crashes per day in the region um, being a frequent incur um, occurrence throughout the region, routinely disrupting congestion, um, the transportation system. We also wanted to note kind of the overlap between a lot of those congested corridors as well as those um, high crash or frequent crash areas within the region. So um, quickly some opportunities to help shape our response to congestion. Um, this kind of goes back to the CMP process that I mentioned where um, there's eight steps that we're working through and uh, we're currently um, making a lot of progress on steps four, five, and six. And so uh, one area is um, in requirement of that process is gathering, um, collecting data to monitor the system. And so we're preparing a performance monitoring plan where we compile the data sets that we're going to look at um, in order to uh, not only achieve our congestion objectives, but to um, kind of analyze the system and uh, the problems in, in better identify where those problems and needs are. Um, and I think with this performance monitoring plan, there's a number of different agencies involved. We've been meeting for uh, months with TDOT, uh, FHWA, as well as uh, WeGo in order to um, clarify some of the um, different data sets that each of the entities is providing. And so th there's a number of agencies with different roles and responsibilities that uh, GNRC heavily relies upon in order to um, you know, showcase presentations like this. Um, and through that effort, we'll, we'll talk about the different timeframes at which that data is collected, um, as well as the um, kind of application of, of how it will be used and analyzed, whether it's at the system level, corridor level, or project level. Another step, um, this is step six, which is uh, identifying the strategies that the region can pursue in order to address some of those congestion problems and needs. And so um, we've been working, um, I think, since the beginning of the year 
really building out our toolbox of strategies that um, you know there, there there was a good toolbox in place from the the last plan update um, but we one of the things that we were looking towards is kind of thinking beyond just infrastructure improvements to to better identify other strategies out there to address congestion and so um, some of those main categories involve you know demand management strategies ge geometric improvements to address bottlenecks um, ITS improvements to uh, for traffic signal coordination and, and management uh, operational strategies and as well as uh, transit improvements to um, uh, improve or reduce delay and improve travel time reli reliability within the corridor. And I should mention too that these are um, will be uh, sending around the, these documents to you all as, as a follow up today. The last one I wanted to mention is um, a policy brief on congestion. Um, I think this largely pertains to step five of identifying the, the problems and needs throughout the region. Um, as you can see, uh, we covered some of the material today about you know causes of traffic congestion, some of the regional trends, as well as uh, some of the key findings. And so um, that'll be another document that you can explore on your own time and, and follow up with any uh, additional questions. Well, thank you so much for that, Sean. Thank you, Max, for the presentation on growth and development predictions and, and Sean for translating it to the transportation system. A few final thoughts before we um, leave you today. Uh, one is another opportunity for you to get involved in shaping our response to um, the challenge for congestion is to plug into one of the ongoing studies. Uh, we have three active studies right now being managed uh, by GNRC or, uh, uh, or GNRC in partnership with WeGo Public Transit and TDOT. Uh, the three big studies right now, the South Corridor Transportation Study, and I know Mayor Moore uh, and, and many other folks along this corridor are on the line with us today, and probably your eyes went right to that corridor, which uh, it, it emerges as really the biggest hot spot uh, in the corridor, uh, which has traditionally been the I-24 corridor, and that continues to be a hot spot, but there's there's a balancing happening through these forecasts. And it's important that we think about what major investments we need to be making in the I-65 corridor between Nashville and the communities in Murray County, largely around the introduction of rapid transit so that as that congestion happens uh, we're not we're not requiring people to be held hostage by that congestion another big study that's underway uh, one of my favorites we've ever done is a look at developing three uh, distinct concepts for uh, significantly improving and redesigning the downtown interstate loop um, this is an effort that right now is um, in a very visionary uh, stage. Um, there's no real expectation that we'll be implementing recommendations uh, from that study uh, in the near future outside of some smaller investments that are sort of incrementally getting us towards the vision. But the idea here is that we bring together uh, downtown businesses and neighborhoods uh, and policymakers and regional commuters together to figure out um, what we really need to be doing to address the region's biggest bottleneck, uh, which is the downtown interstate loop and the convergence of the um, those interstates and those junctions that you know were designed uh, several decades uh, ago. Uh, and then another uh, major effort that is about to wrap up, many of you have already participated in, is a look at uh, regional smart mobility and assessing what's on the ground now. Um, you know, in some cases, you know, I think this effort was. Uh, really eye-opening in that in some cases, you know, we don't really know everything about what's on the ground now. So that's that was a lesson learned. We need to learn more about our assets, how we're using them. Uh, but that paves the way for us to understand what the gap is between Middle Tennessee and high-performing regions of the U.S. and the world when it comes to integrating technology as a way of improving transportation outcomes. All three of those are ongoing, and uh, you can plug into them at solvethistogether.org slash studies. From there, you could also see the long list of uh, studies and research papers that have been completed in recent years. I think there's probably 15 to 20 that are linked there. Um, some of them conducted by GNRC, some of them by WeGo Public Transit, uh, some of them by TDOT. Um, so it's it's not specific to GNRC, it's just the really the relevant transportation studies that will feed into our thinking about this major plant update. So that's one way you can plug in uh, near immediately. Uh, but immediately, what we ask you to do is to, uh, as you sign off today, 
just go immediately to www.gnrc.org slash impressions and let us know uh, how you feel about today's information. It's, you know, you can change your mind, you know, weeks from now, but we really want to capture uh, what's in your head as you leave the workshop today. Also included in that, uh, in that, uh, in that form is a way for you to tell us um, what you want to talk about as we reconvene you uh, in smaller groups uh, to discuss the implications of the findings of the forecast. So go to gnrc.org slash impressions uh, to fill that out. Uh, it'd be very instructive for us. And then finally, the last opportunity we want to mention is at solvethistogether.org, which is the campaign for the regional plan update. Um, if you go to solvethistogether.org slash conversations, uh, we've introduced a new conversation series, uh, which is really aimed at uh, small group uh, facilitated discussions around topics um, that are interested, interesting to you. So it's sort of a choose your own adventure. We've got three posted there right now that pertain to topics that were brought up throughout the course of today's workshop. Uh, and we encourage you to go and, uh, and sign up for one of those. Um, they'll begin the week of July 6. And then finally, um, we do plan uh, to stick around. So uh, we got one last interactive poll question for you today. So as you're uh, answering this last question, and again, you can do this by texting M Skipper 999 to 22333. As you're answering that question, our staff is uh, going through the, the chat box to make sure we can pull out all the questions that haven't been answered. I'd love to turn it over to the, the chair of our Transportation Policy Board, um, which is made up of the city and county mayors and transportation officials who are empowered by federal law to allocate, allocate the federal transportation dollars that we expect to have in our region over the next 20 plus years. Right now, you know, based on current day of apportionments that announce about $10 billion that is set to be allocated uh, through this plan, uh, that'd be federal funds plus the required matching dollars. Uh, and mayor, uh, the mayor of Smyrna, uh, Mary Esther Reed, uh, chairs that group. It's an extremely important job uh, on an extremely important board in terms of shaping Middle Tennessee's future. So Mayor Reed, I know you're with us today. I'd love to give you the final word before we open it up uh, for Q&A. Thanks, Michael. First of all, I want to thank Sean and all of the staff that have worked tirelessly on this. I think um, everybody that's here today can see all of the hard work that's gone into um, the study and presenting this information to us today. So kudos to you guys. Y'all have done a great job. Um, I also want to thank each one of you for taking your time today to um, be on this call and um, because I cannot stress to you how important this is to our overall plan. Um, as a Transportation Policy Board, we have a huge responsibility in making sure that we get this plan right and looking at some of the comments during uh, the presentation. Some of the things you're asking um, are the exact same things that we are. And that's one of the reasons that we feel like there's some unanswered questions based on what's happened over the last couple of months that um, whether it's the tornado or the COVID, um, all of the things that we've been dealing with. So I just want you to understand how important it is, uh, how important this plan is to each one of us and to each one of our communities. It's also important to um, the citizens of this region. And um, so I appreciate you being on the call today, Michael and Sean and all of your group. Thank you so much. And um, I encourage you to interact. I encourage you to ask questions. I encourage you to submit your ideas. Um, that's what's gonna make this a great plan. So thanks to you guys. Thank you so much, Mayor Reed. Um, well, with that, that concludes the prepared remarks for today. Again, we'll stick around for as long as you'd like uh, to go through the questions that have been submitted through the chat and any others that you might have on your mind. Uh, so I'm gonna flip to the next screen and uh, just call this uh, forum uh, open for everyone. Um, let me turn to, to Sean, Max, or any of the other staff that have been on the on the line following the chat box. Um, what do we've got going on here that might be unanswered? The 
I think there's a number of comments uh, related to COVID and the, the impacts in the short term and in long term. Um, I know that we didn't capture that in today's slides, but it, it is something that staff's been monitoring and included in, in some of the previous uh, transportation coordinating committee, transportation policy board presentations of monitoring some of those trends um, and, and what their potential impact is going to be in, in the short and long term. Um, and you know, I think staff has had some some conversations internally about uh, what are potential. I think there's been a lot of scenario running um, in many different fields, um, knowing that nobody has a, a crystal ball. But um, you know, we we've looked into what are some of the capabilities maybe that we could utilize with the model in order to um, you know uh, capture some of the the changes like the significant drop in people that are actually commuting um, into work on a daily basis. Okay, thank you for that. What, uh, what other questions are out there, either in the chat or any new questions that haven't submitted yet? Anybody wanna, wanna go for it? I've got a question from Mayor Campbell. Is there any consensus on what the likely scenarios are? Do we anticipate that um, per Steve plan will have an influx? Mayor Campbell, are you, um, is your uh, audio on? Are you able to uh, maybe elaborate a little bit more on your question for the group? I just saw, can you hear me? Sure can. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I just saw the uh, comment from Steve Bland and um, hadn't really thought about that, that, that we might be uh, having an influx of people in other cities who are trying to get out of larger cities and just wondered if that was something that you you had anticipated and considered or if there's any kind of analysis or information that that indicates to you that that might be a, a possibility. Yeah, I think um, let me I'll do a first uh, take at this, but then turn it over to Max who could dig into the numbers a little bit. But I think that's been our experience over the last um, you know, five to 10 years, particularly since about, you know, 2007, just before that last uh, great recession, uh, was Nashville's popularity amongst relocating corporations that were um, coming here from more expensive and more crowded metro areas uh, that um, some of those were tax reasons, some of those were quality of life reasons. Often those are the same thing, are very related. So I think that's been the trend for a while. You know, what's interesting though, so as we do community engagement, what you find is that those folks moving from more expensive, more crowded regions also are the first to have the expectation that we have multimodal options and quality transit. Um, so I think the trend is real and I think the trend continues. I think it continues as long as we uh, have a, um, an, you know, a, a region with a high quality of life and a place where people can be prosperous, I think will continue to be a, an attractor for, uh, for companies and, um, and creative capital from across the country and the world to move to. But I think, you know, we've got to do our part to make this uh, a, a place that's, um, that's a, a place people want to be. Um, uh, and then, you know, also uh, what has emerged over the last couple of years uh, in response to those trends about the influx of folks from other places is a real wake up call from our own local residents who have been here for their whole life, uh, who also want to make sure that we're uh, thinking about them, that we're not doing everything uh, for the new folks, but that we're thinking about reinvesting in uh, traditional neighborhoods, uh, catching up our sidewalk infrastructure, uh, maintaining affordability so we uh, minimize the amount of dis uh, d uh, um, um, displacement that occurs as a result of the, the higher level of attractiveness. So, uh, Max, you, anything to add in terms of, I, I know we can share the numbers for folks to dig into, but any any reflection on the, the data sets themselves? No, I think you, you hit the nail on the head in terms of the, the historic trend. And, you know, we are an attractive place. I think that the, the forecasts that were provided in 2017 that we're using were probably, um, I don't want to say over aggressive, but they were very aggressive uh, growth numbers. So in, in terms of us receiving even more than expected um, as a result of COVID. You know, I, it's probably too early to know for sure. You know, we're only three months into it. Um, as time goes on, you know, we're, we're definitely going to continue to monitor that. Um, 
you know, my gut tells me that the people that are uncomfortable with living in, in super dense major metros that are moving to Nashville are likely equal to the people that live in Nashville now that might become uncomfortable with the the density or the growth that's occurring here and might move to, you know, smaller communities through, throughout the Southeast. So, I, I, you know, jury's out. If I knew the answer, I'd probably be in Vegas. Um, but that that's my gut feeling. Well, until we have clarity on the impacts of um, the virus on migration flows, um, I, you know, I would encourage you to go to that gnrc.org slash dashboards webpage, where one of those dashboards is um, a really good interactive um, tool for you to see where people are moving from uh, from across the country into our region. Uh, and it's done at the county level, so you can see those county relationships. Um, and kudos to Max and uh, the research team, uh, Ashley and Carson and Sam and Harry for, for all they've done on those dashboards. All right, we got some other questions in the chat. Um, Jace, uh, Justin Cole with MTA, uh, WeGo Public Transit wants to know to what degree is transit being considered in the inner loop study? Um, you know, so I think when we scoped that study and we put out the, the request for for uh, for proposals to um, to that, you know, we really we framed this as being um, a major, essentially a major. Re what's the what are the possibilities for a me major reconstruction of the downtown interstate loop with a few things as a given? One of those things is. Uh, greater integration of multimodal options uh, within that footprint. Um, that was that was certainly just a given as part of our assumptions for the future. I'll come back to that in a second. The other expectation was that um, whatever we did it needed to not only um, minimize impact on a lot of the traditionally underserved neighborhoods that are around that area that were just devastated, you know, in the 50s and 60s when that infrastructure originally went in. Not only do we want to make sure they're a critical part of designing what we're what we're doing, um, but that um, we find ways of giving back and healing some of the distrust and healing some of the um, fraction fractioning that happened um, uh, and has been happening since then. So those were the two expectations I'd say we had is one is that this can't be a highway expansion project for cars only. And two, we need to give back to the community. Uh, downtown is a neighborhood uh, for residential uses and businesses and is a destination for people all across the region, the state and the nation. Um, specifically as it relates to the multimodal accommodations, you know, right now we're, we're very agnostic. Uh, we're trying to figure out, you know, what is the, um, what are the looking at the existing structures you know what should stay what should go uh, what should be the footprint of the future uh, infrastructure around downtown nashville um how how should we uh sort of cap um some of the depressed depressed in terms of the sort of the physical depression of the interstate on the western side uh, how how should we incorporate some of the vision that was established through the plan of nashville to reclaim land on the east bank um, for higher and better uses and so i'd say right now we're very agnostic about the type of transit that would be woven into these concepts but the concepts themselves are very much expected to introduce a higher level of transit service within the study uh, within the within the corridor around downtown. All right, we've got a question. I'm going to um, put Max on notice to respond to some of this here. But Bill McCord is asking about the population projections from Woods and Pool that we use. And of course, let me clarify that. So we, the county level numbers for people and jobs is coming from a national forecast done by Woods and Pool Economics. What we do as staff is that we build a, a allocation model that um, distributes the people and jobs to the parcel level, which then we could re-aggregate to sub-county geography, including municipalities. Uh, so the figures that you're getting at the municipal level or sub-county are sourced from GNRC, controlled by the Woods and Pool county level numbers, and then the county level numbers are obviously from the Woods and Pool. There is um, there's a there is a mixture of agencies um, across the state and within our region that use Woods and Pool, uh, but also um, understand that the state has its own uh, population employment projections that are produced out of UT, and often those don't match exactly. So the questions often raised um, 
in, in the case of Bill, um, uh, it was not so much a bill a question bill it's more of a, a a point that we need to discuss the differences between the two and the implications of having two sets of uh, population projections projections that are out there uh, i'll say one thing before i turn it over to max for his reflection on the value of woods and pool over the state's numbers because there are there's several advantages to using uh, the woods and pool national forecast um i you know forecasts are 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 just a prediction. It's a crystal ball. You know, we won't know if we were right until we get to the horizon that we were planning for. But what we do know is that if we're going to continue to be in a growing region, that eventually we're probably going to get to those numbers. We just may be off by, you know, a year or two or three or four or five. And so it's important when we do planning at a regional level. And, and it's important for when you do planning at a local level that you're looking at a range of scenarios. Uh, high growth, medium growth, low growth. So you understand the implications of the rates of change on your community. And so you can be ready to, uh, you know, accelerate or slow down uh, plan investments and policy changes. And so we try not to get too fixated on the specific numbers, but obviously when you're doing modeling of impacts, you got to settle on a set of numbers to run a scenario. The key is to run multiple scenarios so you understand the range within which you're, you're going to be uh, making decisions. Max, any observations about really the, the, the benefit of Woods and Pool, particularly as it relates to the state's numbers? Yeah, I think you touched on it uh, coming from a, a um, nested prediction. So, so looking at the national uh, forecast and then then breaking it out by state or metro um, region, state, uh, metropolitan area, and then eventually county, um, all using the the same controls. Uh, at, you know, compared to the state's numbers, they. Uh, based theirs on uh, births, deaths, in, mi in migration, out migration patterns, and so you know it. They are going to vary significantly, but they they are valuable. Um, and and I think that you know something that we like to do is make sure that we are comparing ourselves to those. Um, one of our dashboard links for forecast actually lines up not only the state's forecast and the current forecast that, that we're using for the plan, but also our previous forecast uh, for um, 2012 and 2008 and, and kind of puts everything into comparison. So, so everything that we do should really be looking at kind of that, that higher end or expectation and a lower end or expectation. Um, but, yeah, but thank you, Max. Good, good That's a great that. reminder that the dashboards website has the comparison that Bill um, is suggesting, so we can look at um, how they compare. The other, I, I, I'd add that the other value to Woods and Pool is the granularity um, that exists in terms of detail for the number of people that we're talking about. So Woods and Pool takes it a, a step further than the state traditionally does, and not only estimates the number of folks that might be here, but what their demographics are. Um, you know, the, the product really comes off uh, the shelf as if you're familiar with like the, the census files for demographics and socioeconomics. I mean, it really comes off the shelf as though it were a census file for some year into the future, um, which is very valuable because when you're trying to understand the impacts of growth on infrastructure and social service needs. Um, it's not just the volume of people that matter, it's the makeup of those folks um, that often uh, matter more. And hey, what other questions I'll add to that, that um, Woods and Pool also provides employment um, forecast. Okay. I'm, no, there's a comment from Dory about changes in school systems might adopt to uh, uh, spread up roads yeah so you know sc school siting uh, has been on the radar of regional planners uh, at the mpo for for some years i think back to i think it was 2009 when leslie Meehan, when she was on our staff uh, hosted just a really excellent um, regional symposium on school siting that brought together the uh, school facility planners uh, school board members with local land use planners and regional uh, infrastructure planners to think about um, along with national experts to think about the unattended consequences and costs of some of the practices that we use to site schools across Middle Tennessee. And it's obviously not limited to Middle Tennessee. Uh, it's a sort of a national uh, 
national challenge to find sites for schools that have acreage minimums at the right price. And so just sort of rethinking some of those parameters that drive our school siting decisions um, every once in a while to make sure we're making an optimized decision. All right, what other questions do we have out there? Uh, Max, Sean, you seeing any others in the chat? Uh, I saw that Elwin um, had inquired if we would be doing something similar for transit. Um, if, if you want to provide your, your answer first. Yeah, so I, I saw your response in the chat, which is spot on, which is that the travel demand model uh, output that Sean went through today, and, and we understand it was largely focused on uh, the highway side because uh, of the context for uh, trying to understand uh, changes in traffic congestion um, between now and the future. But the model also produces ridership forecasts uh, and essentially boarding and alighting information for stops that are coded into the model um, over all the same years that um, we showed for VMT and VHT. The, the one thing, you know, I think the, the model performs, performs fairly well when it comes to um, the type of transit that we have out there today, which is mixed traffic transit, generally speaking, uh, on a fixed route, uh, fixed times of day. Um, when it comes to thinking about transit ridership potential for high capacity transit and transit and dedicated lanes, um, often um, that's what necessitates us to do a special study because in doing that, uh, we've got to think through how that investment itself will change ridership, uh, which is not assumed in the current model. So the current model is assuming land use and development as Max presented based on current zoning and land use policies and the way the market is reacting to those today. Uh, and you change to fixed route, you know, sort of mixed traffic uh, uh, bus service here or there, it doesn't really alter assumptions for growth. Um, but you introduce gold standard bus rapid transit or light rail or commuter rail, and it itself will change those assumptions. And so I know many of you are familiar with the South Quarter study that's underway now. Um, and, and the bulk of the effort around those studies is really working with the community uh, at large, the business community, those that are doing economic development, uh, and then those that are responsible for local zoning and land use and urban design guidelines and so on and so forth, to try to figure out what the pattern looks like. How's the market, what's the market look like uh, in a transit scenario, a high capacity transit scenario, so that we can simulate ridership um, more fairly than what we could do now if we just coded a light rail line on top of the existing forecast. So that's my first, my, my uh, my initial response, Max, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, the only uh, other thing that I would add is that we do work with uh, the local transit agencies. So Justin and Hannah, if, if y'all are on the line, you know, we, we provide the land use information for use in the more localized tools to, to help determine ridership or, um, you know, potential best operations. So there is coordination beyond what, what is coming out of the travel demand model. All right, and now if you're still on the line, I see your follow up at 1139. Um, you have any more uh, like detailed questions about some of the performance measures you want to get out there now, or is that something you'd like to follow up with us later? All right. Well, um, you may have hopped off or could be on mute. Um, what other questions we have out there? We still have, let's do a count. We have 49, we still have 49 folks on the on the call. That's, that's pretty impressive um, given what time it is. It's about noon now. Uh, so we'll probably start to wrap up here in a bit. Um, any other questions before we do a reminder of the immediate opportunities that are in front of you for, for getting involved? Michael, I saw uh, one question from, or I guess a statement from Marty about uh, traffic rebounding to 90% pre-pandemic uh, using the NRIX. And I'll, I'll just plug that, you know, we're, we're continuing to use NRIX to monitor um, as well and haven't seen rebound yet, but we're still looking at May. So when, when June comes out, um, hopefully it'll tell a slightly different 
different story. And then I believe Bill put another one in asking if future year congestion projections take into account um, changes in TDM strategies being implemented or signal coordination slash uh, traffic operations improvements. Yeah, well, I'm not, you know, just the, to Marty's, uh, uh, the link that he shared. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I think over the over the long term, you know, just the theory of triple convergence that many, many transportation planners are aware of, which is that, you know, capacity um, often induces uh, demand to account for that capacity. Just, you know, thinking through that theory and how it might apply in this case, I mean, I think it's to be expected that we do have a full rebound on traffic volumes and certainly with growth, um, even if there is a, a slight decrease in the in the, the amount we're all traveling individually because of changing behaviors as a result of the pandemic, it'll still be, um, still be an uptick in volumes overall. I think what I'd be most curious about is as the volumes return, how have the time of day uh, and distance pattern shifted? Um, I think, you know, a lot of people are predicting that telework, um, sort of segues to Bill's question, telework will be um, much more in the mix moving forward. Uh, I think we've all overcome our fear of, you know, what a widespread telework policy would do to our companies. Um, and so I think that'll be around. So this is obviously going to change the commute trip um, aspect of regional travel, which, by the way, you know, we focus a lot on uh, because of the peak travel period demand that's out there that's visible um, and is the poster child for our, our issues. But commute trips are only about 16 percent of the trips that we make as a residential population. So, you know, there's just a lot of trip making that's out there that's beyond going to and from work. But when you alter that commute uh, behavior, it will have a uh, it will have an impact on the performance that we're seeing through the modeling now. And then repeat that question from Bill. Just asking if it is taken into account with the, the forecast that we were showing. Yeah, so to some extent, and you know, you and your team are going to be able to answer more specifically here, but let me instead offer, instead of what we have done through the modeling, that's, that's something we have yet to do. So um, we need to make some assumptions for uh, shifts to telework. And we need to make some assumptions for how successful we may be with some of the TDM strategies. And that's something we can certainly do with these models, whether or not they're part of our core assumptions right now. So we can show you what would happen if you see a 10 to 20% increase in work from home. I mean, we can run that scenario and see what kind of impacts it has on the transportation network. Um, so as you think through those, Bill, and everyone else about, you know, what scenarios would you want to see tested through the modeling? Um, that's something we can talk about. Um, another thing that we should test that isn't, you know, fundamentally part of the, the model right now is the role of automation and what that will do um, to uh, the prediction. And so, you know, there's a lot of national research happening now, has been happening over the last couple of years that doesn't really, it hasn't really demonstrated that uh, it's going to, you know, make a significant ding to levels of congestion. Uh, it just made it's probably more of a, you know, whether or not you're in control of that vehicle or not. Um, so I think everyone's still trying to wrap their heads around you know, how it will ultimately impact our daily experiences. But I don't think yet there's the expectation that it is a panacea to traffic congestion unless you just care less about congestion if you're on your phone, you know, while you're in it. So your ideas for scenarios we could run are uh, fully welcomed. And something we can talk about at these uh, these conversations uh, that we've uh, that will kick off July 6. Um, I'll plug that before we head out. All right. Well, coming up ten after uh, ten after the hour, I'm going to ask Sean to wrap us up. Um, as our transportation planning manager, a lot of this has been focused today on on transportation. Um, thought, uh, Sean, any thoughts about um, up upcoming work that we would do with the uh, transportation policy board that you want everybody to know about um, before we uh, end this session? 
Uh, I think one thing to note is we we've outlined a number of topics that we're going to touch on in the coming months. Um, I think safety is the next on our uh, agenda. Um, and then we have equity, environment, um, economic opportunity. And so I think one thing to note is that congestion is going to um, continue to resurface in a lot of those other discussions. And so um, I think we'll further communicate kind of the um, relationship with um, you know congestion and safety, congestion on economic opportunities uh, as we move forward. All right, well, very good. Thanks everyone for sticking around with us. Uh, I'm really impressed by the, the turnout today. We'll get this uh, recording posted online and try to make the PowerPoint available for those who couldn't attend as a self-guided tour. Um, but again, visit gnrc.org slash impressions today, and then go to solvethistogether.org slash conversations to get plugged into the uh, ongoing uh, discussion about the topics that you're interested in. Again, thanks everyone for being here. Great, great job to staff and um, um, look forward to talking with y'all again soon.